This is the fifth lecture in the first semester Java course presented by Savage River Research. To view all of the currently available lectures, point your browser to savageriverresearch.com and click on Open Courses. This lecture assumes that you completed lectures one through four and are prepared to proceed with lecture five. And in this lecture, we're going to take a closer look at several distinct uses of the plus operator, many of which have a direct bearing on the topic of actually printing the output of our computations. In example 5.1, we'll examine a variety of ways in which the behavior of the plus operator varies depending on context. Here the plus operator is used in the ordinary way. 212 is added to 313, and the sum of that addition is assigned to the variable number, a variable of data type int. But here it's used to concatenate, that is to say join, the string hello to the string world to produce an output which is the single string hello space world. The space is generated because I hit the space bar after typing lowercase o, but before I type the double quote character. But here, the literal integer value 4 follows the concatenation symbol. Any integer or floating point literal following a concatenation symbol that follows a string in this case, the string the value is, will be printed out as the number. But here the variable name number is concatenated to the string, but it is the value of that variable that is printed out. But now there are two literals sequentially concatenated to the string. These two literals these values will not be added. They will simply be printed out sequentially, 2 followed immediately by 3. Now here's where it gets even more difficult. On line 14, when the println method, that's the method that's enforcing all of this, when the println method evaluates its parameter and reads 4 plus 3 before it encounters a string, it interprets that as an arithmetic operation, sums them to 7, and places the result in an internal buffer, a buffer maintained by method println. Spaces, not enclosed in quotes, are simply discarded. So the next symbol encountered by println the second plus symbol can be interpreted as either a plus operator or a concatenation symbol. The only way to determine that is to read the next character, which is a quote. On reading a quote, Printlin will continue reading until it finds another quote. Everything between those two quotes including spaces, is treated as part of a literal string, except for, except for what? What could possibly appear between those two quotes that would be treated differently? Think back. Think back to lecture three. To this slide. Seven escape sequences, all beginning with a backslash. But this is it, just these seven a backslash, swallow, backslash followed by anything other than the seven shown here, like this example, will be a compile time error. If you want to print a backslash, this is the only way to do it. So, in the buffer, the text string is a prime number, is appended to seven. Then when the compiler encounters plus 6, plus 7, it simply concatenates them to the current string in the buffer 
and does the same thing with the remaining concatenation. All that remains is the semicolon after, uh, after the Printland method, which signals the dump to the contents, to the buffer, to the console. Now, it behaves the same way when we use floating point numbers instead of integers. Now, I'm sure that somewhere there exists an arcane rule to govern this behavior, and I'm sure it reads something like a sequence of multiple plus signs joining numeric literals or variables encountered before any string are treated as mathematical operators for any such sequence after a string, one or more plus signs will be treated as concatenation. If you think it might be useful in some future problem domain, give it a try. But use the test case to check your output carefully to confirm that it actually does what you wanted. Now, in a few minutes, I'll introduce you to Oracle's online Java documentation which is incredibly useful. Uh, but for some reason, I found none of this in the documentation, so I put this together by trial and error. Now, let's look at the idea of variable assignment and initialization. Obviously, in order to store a value in a variable, an assignment statement is required. The assignment operator is what you and I think of as the equal sign. The operand on the left side of the assignment operator must be a variable name. The operand on the right side must be either a literal or an expression that evaluates to a type that is compatible with the type of the variable. The variables must be declared and initialized before they can be used. Here the variable names, month and days, are declared as type int. Once declared, they can then receive a value. That's initialization. However, the value must be compatible with the variable's declared type. And after receiving the value, variables can then be used in output statements or in other calculations. Local variables can be declared and initialized on the same line, but variables can only hold one value at a time. Also note that variables do not receive a default value, and trying to use uninitialized variables will generate a syntax error, a compile time error. When the code is written, it'll show up. Furthermore, Eclipse will identify the source of the error with a squiggly red line as it does for month on line 8 and days on line 9. In example 5.4, neither one was initialized, so neither one can be used by method printlin. Okay, let's do some work on Eclipse. This is example 5.5, five. and if you code it correctly, this is the output you should get. Now, again, the purpose of these exercises is to allow you to determine whether or not you understand and can apply the material we've looked at so far. Everything you need to know has been covered in the lectures, so pause the recording here, code the solution on your Eclipse IDE, debug it, and test it. Once you're certain you've got it, Restart the recording, and I'll briefly cover the solution. Okay, hopefully you've paused and done your own work, and now I'll cover my solution. At this point, you should have no trouble creating the shell for class example 5.5. The file new class selection yields the new Java class screen. Type the class name in, and then I'm going to suggest that you move your cursor to this checkbox and left-click to check it, which will create the shell for the main method. So, once you click Finish, 
your code will automatically contain the shell for the main method. Now, my personal experience, and my personal preference rather, is to restructure this way, but clearly you should develop your own preferences. Let me change the view to give working room in the editor, and I'll post the requirements in the upper right corner. And if we do that, we can code the solution right off the problem description. Declare three integer variables, a, b, and c. Set a to 9, b to 10, c to 11. Declare three double variables, double a, double b, and double c. Set a, a to 12, b, b to 13, c, c to 14. Declare any other variables necessary to complete the following calculations. Calculate the sum of the three integers and the average of the three integers. Calculate the sum of the three doubles and the average of the three doubles. Calculate the modulus of the division of the sum of the three integers divided by the average of the three integers. I'll put the results of the calculation formatted exactly as shown in the green box. And we can read the parameters for the six println statements right off the green box. Okay, let's try one more. Program five. Pause your recording and take a moment to read through the program description. This is the required output. Now, at this point, I'm starting to introduce what will become increasingly complex problem domains. This is a small step in that direction, but it's a good time to introduce a critical asset in creating computational solutions to complex problems. This problem domain requires that I calculate the area of three circles and use that data to find something called the Ariadne number. Then use the Ariadne number to calculate something called the Forbath number. Now, to pull that off, we're gonna to have to find a reasonably accurate value for pi, which of course is an irrational number. So does Java offer any help? Not just for pi, but more importantly for all the increasingly difficult math-driven problem domains that you'll face in the real world. So let's see what Java has to offer. And that is this, an enormous volume of documentation that Oracle, which owns Java, makes available at this site. So if you feed this URL into your browser, you should get this page. And if you click on Java SE Technical Documentation, you should see this. Now place your cursor on the vertical scroll bar and drag it down to view the specifications page. Now click on API Documentation and you should see this. And what we're interested in here is the Foundational Application Programming Interfaces, APIs, of the Java SE platform. You can use the scroll bar to look down at all the modules available in the API for the Java SE. SE is just an acronym for Standard Edition. Note that the Modules tab shows up in orange when we're actually in the Modules section of the API specification. Now, as we'll see in a moment, modules are simply a container for a set of related packages. And each of those packages is primarily a container for a set of related classes. And the classes themselves will contain a set of methods and fields that implement the behavior of each of those classes. Now, let me take you through all that one step at a time. If I click here, I'm in the module java.base. 
And these are some of the packages that are available in module java.base. And if I wanted to see the others, I'd just scroll down. But what I'm looking for is something that can help me solve math problems. And this looks like a likely place to start. But it's not. The package java.math with the lowercase m only deals with the huge integers we'll need to solve public key encryption problems. And if you're taking this course as a prerequisite to the Savage River courses in networking, public key encryption, and their application to a, a broad range of problems from secure communication to cryptocurrencies to cryptographically enforceable contracts, you'll definitely be using this package. But right now, we're going to look at java.lang, short for language, java.lang, which provides the classes that are fundamental to the design of the Java programming language. So click here, and we have a display that shows the set of the set of classes available in package java.lang, which is one of the many packages available in module java.base. Now, put your cursor on the slider bar and drag it down to here, which should expose the math class. The class math contains methods for performing basic numeric operations such as the elementary exponential logarithm square root and trigonometric functions. Uh, if I click on that, I get a generalized description of class math on a page whose class tab is in orange and which shows that class math is one of several classes found in package java.lang, which is in turn one of several packages found in module java.base. Now, let's scroll down to expose the fields and methods that class math provides to accomplish the tasks that it claims to cover. This is the introduction to the use of existing classes readily available in the JDK, the Java Development Kit, classes that will dramatically simplify the solution of complex problem domains. The math class provides two fields. At this point, you can think of a field as predefined values for certain mathematical constants. In this case, capital E, which is the base of a natural logarithm, base of natural logarithms, and capital PI, pi, which is the ratio of the circumference of a circle to its diameter. I can plug these identifiers into my code wherever I need to use E or pi in a computation. In addition to these fields, class math provides a set of methods called functions or subroutines in C and C++. And if we scroll down, we'll see some familiar ones, like cos, COS, the cosine associated with an angle, or cos H, the hyperbolic cosine. Further down, we can find a method that returns the hypotenuse of a right triangle, given the the uh, two sides. And here, the manipulation of logarithms. And here, the raising of a number a to power b, along with the generation of random numbers. Now, we will be using the services of the math class throughout this course, so we may as well start with a simple problem. Program 5. Given three circles of radii R1, R2, and R3, the Ariadne number is calculated as 
the area of the largest circle divided by the sum of the areas of the two smaller circles. The four math numbers calculated by dividing the Ariadne number by the product of the radii of the two smaller circles. The output of program 5 should be as shown. Now clearly, we're going to have to calculate the area of the three circles defined by the three radii, R1, R2, and R3. Well, remember from high school trigonometry that the formula for the area of a circle is pi times the square of the radius, where pi is defined as the ratio of the circumference of a circle to the diameter. Unfortunately, pi is also an irrational number, and here are the first 474 digits after the decimal point. Fortunately for us, the math class has a name constant pi, capital P-I, which contains the first 15 digits, which is sufficient to cover all but the most exacting domains. So, open Eclipse. Give it a try. The solution will be presented at the beginning of the next lecture. Here's what we just covered in uh, Lecture 5, and here's where we're going in Lecture 6.